Thank you. Welcome, everyone, um, to Commit to Keiki's Talk Story session. Um, today, we're very pleased to have with us gubernatorial candidate Kai Kahele. Um, for those of you that don't know, Commit to Keiki is a nonpartisan education initiative in partnership with the Early Childhood Action Strategy Partners, the business community, philanthropy, and professionals and advocates from early learning, mental health, and family violence prevention. Our primary goal is to be a resource to the gubernatorial candidates and our next governor to ensure that investments are made that support young children and families. Today we have with us Terry George, President and CEO of the Harold K. Castle Foundation and Education Chair of the Hawaii Business Roundtable, who will be our moderator today. Let me go over a couple of quick points about how this talk story will work. It's intended to be a conversation with Representative Kahele We'd like to hear from him about how he intends to prioritize programs and services for Hawaii's youngest Kiki and their families. Um, our moderator will kick things off with some questions, and then we'd like to open it up for Q&A with our audience. Commit to Kiki Steering Committee members will have an opportunity to come off mute and on screen to ask their questions. Others in the audience, if you can please send your questions via the chat function, that would be great, and we'll make sure that we get to as many of those questions as we can in this hour long discussion. Until we get to the Q&A, we ask that everyone please turn your videos off, except for Congressman um, and Terry, so that we can spotlight the speakers. This forum is being recorded and will be made publicly available on Alelo. Thank you all very much for joining us in this what to be a very informative and exciting discussion. Um, Terry, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Carrie, and aloha, everyone. Um, as Carrie mentioned, I'm Terry George, I'm president and CEO of the Harold Kale Castle Foundation. Um, several years ago, Carrie and I learned about a 2018 effort in California, the Choose Children campaign, and that resulted in California's new governor committing significant state investment in early childhood health, safety, and learning. And we're excited to embark on something similar in Hawaii, commit to Keiki. So as I mentioned, the result in California has had a significant impact on children and families, and we believe and hope that the same thing can happen here in Hawaii. So without any further ado, it's my pleasure to start the conversation by introducing you to Congressman Kai Kahele. Um, Kai, want, you want to be called Kai, it's really hard because you're a congressman, no but no. I'll just start off trying to be informal if I can. Um, Kai is a native Hawaiian hailing from Hawaii's last remaining fishing village of Milo Li'i in South Kona on Hawaii Island. Um, he's a proud product of Hawaii's public school system. Uh, you graduated from Hilo High in 1992. You went on to earn a, a bachelor's in education uh, yep. from UH Manoa, right? Yep. Um, Congressman Kahele is also a combat veteran, a pilot, and a commissioned officer in the Hawaii Air National Guard, U.S. Air Force, where he continues to serve as a lieutenant colonel at Hickam Air Force Base. Yep. Uh, Congressman Kahele is also a pilot for Hawaiian Airlines. Busy guy. <laughs> wear, I wear a lot of hats. <laughs> you do. Um, and then the last part of the intro, just so folks know you a little bit more, is yeah. that in 2016, you were appointed to the Hawaii State Senate uh, for District 1 by Governor David Ige. Yes. Um, and I just want to acknowledge your father, Gil Kahele, uh, a tremendous public servant. Um, during your tenure, Kai, as a state senator, you served as the majority whip and majority floor leader, as well as the chair of the committees on higher education and water and land. And then in 2020, Kai was elected to represent Hawaii's second con congressional district in Washington, D.C., serving on two House committees, the Transportation Infrastructure Committee and the Armed Services Committee. And Congressman Kahele currently lives in Hilo with his wife, Maria, and their two daughters. Yep. So welcome, Kai. We really appreciate Hello. you spending time. Great introduction. Um, Thank you for having me. Sounds like I'm campaigning for you. I promise this is nonpartisan, but we're, nonpartisan. we really want to lift up people who are aspiring to the yes. highest position in our state government. Um, and that leads to my first question for you. Tell us anything more about yourself you want to share and why you're interested in running for governor at this point. Well, you know, mahalo for the opportunity. It's great to be here. I'm excited to share, you know, my values and vision for Hawaii and where we can take this together. I'm also really interested in listening and uh, making sure I hear from uh, all of you on where you think our state needs to go. You know, this, 
this campaign, this election is, is not about me. It's about us. It's uh, always been a Kako thing. You know, I'm not running to be governor of Hawaii. I'm running to do something as governor of Hawaii. And uh, I've just been so fortunate over the last 48 years of my life, and I just turned 48 uh, this year, to be able to be exposed to unique experiences, unique opportunities, um, some out of tragedy. When my dad passed away. Others, um, you know, out of just sheer hard work um, that helped shape the person that's in front of you today. And the person that I best believe uh, is capable and equipped uh, to lead this state over the next four years and hopefully uh, through this next decade. Um, so let me follow up with one thing you, you mentioned, Congressman Kelly. You said you really don't want to be governor. You want to do something for the state. So the elephant in the room, people will be asking, so aren't you already doing something for the state from Washington, D.C.? So maybe get a little bit more specific into why the governor's seat will allow you to do what you most want to do for the state. And then we'll turn to questions about Keiki. Sure. Great question. And I get asked that often. Um, why aren't you staying in Congress? You know, you're doing a great job for us there. We need a Hawaiian in Congress. You know, you, had a long, you could have a long career in the United States Congress. I've never been that type of person. You know, uh, when I answered the call to replace my dad in the state Senate, um, I did that partly because my dad asked me before he died to replace him in the state Senate. This is not something I thought I was ever going to do. Politics was not part of my plan. Um, but given the opportunity to serve in the state Senate, opened my eyes to a whole nother opportunity to serve this state, which I had already been doing as a member of the Hawaii Air National Guard and Armed Forces. Um, I've realized by being in Washington, D.C. over the last two years, and spending as much time as I can in Hawaii, in the district, that we have major issues in this state. We are at a crossroads. We are at an inflection point. And in order to solve the most challenging issues that affect people's everyday lives, I can only do it, I believe, as governor of Hawaii. I've spent a lot of time in Hawaii's second congressional district over the last 17 months. I think more than my predecessor did, um, when, when she was representing the district. And I've had a chance to sit at people's kitchen tables. I've had a chance to sit um, and have morning coffee with veterans. All, and I constantly hear the same issues over and over. And these are not federal issues. These are issues that require decisive, bold, courageous leadership, someone who has a strategic vision for this state and can bring people together to solve some of the most challenging issues that we have to deal with today in Hawaii. So. Just like in the military, when you come into a position of leadership, you're there for two, three years, and the military moves you on to a next position of leadership. That's how I've led the last 21 years of my life. I have gone to Washington, D.C. I know where this state is broken in terms of the federal state connection, and, and I want to fix it immediately. And to bring that experience back from Washington to the office of the governor is something no other candidate has. They don't have the experience. They don't have those relationships. It is a value added for this state. And I believe that uh, we are going to do that. I have big, bold ideas of how to reorganize the office of the governor, how to connect Washington, D.C. to this state, which ultimately funds many of the programs we're about to talk about. That's right. Speaking uh, of which, let's go ahead and start talking about those. Some of those issues you learn having coffee with folks and just talking with folks in their carports and kitchen tables. As you know, Commit to Keiki has three priorities that we believe are critical for healthy early childhood development. Um, they're number one, access to affordable child care yep. and early childhood programs. Number two, access to family violence prevention and intervention programs and services. And number three, access to early childhood and ohana mental health supports. So I'm going to ask you questions about each one of those three priorities to find out how your administration will support increasing access in each of those issue areas of early care and learning, um, family violence prevention and intervention, and then mental health supports for Keiki and Ohana. So we'll start with a first priority if we, if we can, Congressman. Um, we recently shared with you and your campaign a, a statewide poll that Commit to Keiki commissioned. And it asked voters a series of questions about issues of importance to them and what they think our next governor should address when it comes to our youngest children and their ohana. 
we were actually surprised and delighted that um, 74.5% of all respondents believe our next governor must invest more to create a series of high quality, public funded, community based childcare and early learning programs. So they know we should invest more. And I wondered how will your administration invest more to increase access to affordable and quality childcare and early learning? Great question. You have to pay for it. And we have right. to have the funding to fund these critical programs. There's only so much revenue, so many tax, so much of our tax base that is available. What I have seen, and this is going to answer all three of your questions, is we are not leveraging, this state is not leveraging the amount of federal funding that it should be leveraging, and it should be receiving from the federal government, partly because we don't apply for all of the programs that are there. We don't have the grant writing capacity and capability to do that. And so whether it's the Child Care and Development Block Grant, or it's the Child Care Stabilization Grants, or the other types of federal fundings, uh, and we can talk about those because those were, those were a big part of the American Rescue Plan that I was a, had, a, had, a, had a role in along with the rest of the members of the delegation. We need to create a stronger relationship with the federal government, with the congressional delegation, and, and be applying for as many federal discretionary grants or these CDBG block grants that are available that can address many of the issues that you just talked about. One of the things I would do, if... if your, if given the opportunity to serve as your governor, is I would like to have a Washington, D.C. office for the state of Hawaii. I would like a person to be in Washington, D.C. representing the state of Hawaii that is part of the executive branch that works directly with the office of the governor and works with our grant writing team in the office of the governor and with other programs, nonprofit organizations, um, and the organizations that you represent to work together with the state and the county and the federal government. We need someone there. Other states do this. We are not doing this. With the amount of American Rescue Plan money that is available through at least 2024, with the amount of infrastructure money that is available for the state for the next five years, we have to have a constant presence in Washington, which is that belly button to the office of the governor. So whether it's, whether it's pulling in expertise from the University of Hawaii or throughout the community or with our nonprofits that have grant writing capability and capacity, we need to be going after every piece of federal dollar that's available. And that's a unique perspective that that's given me in Washington, D.C. And, and I'll just say, finally, the one thing I heard constantly over and over the last 17 months from federal agencies, when whether it's addressing wastewater, child care, any type of federal funds that are available is the state of Hawaii is not applying for those grants. Yeah, I've heard the same thing, Congressman, and, and I like your idea of a really tightening up that relationship with DC. Let's you assume for a minute you can't that wake up at six in the morning and the rest of the country is it's already noon. Yeah, I agree. We are six hours behind. So I mean that that's something that well, being there and seeing it, I realize we gotta do. We're forty two states behind. We rank forty third yep. in the amount of state government funding for early care and learning. We're going to fix that. Not okay. Um, so right. let's assume for some reason, hypothetically, let's say we succeed in solving that problem and maxing out on um, the federal funding that we're, we have available. What are the other things that we need to do to increase access to affordable childcare and, and preschool? I mean, you need teachers, right? You need childcare spaces, especially in rural and remote areas. Yes. So what thoughts do you have besides the additional uh, dollars that we can bring in federally or deploy from our state coffers to increase that access. You so know, how does a kid in Hana, Kipahulu, Keanai, yep. uh, Hamakua Coast, North Kohala get access? My wife and I have raised two little girls that are now six and eight. And we just went through early childhood education. We just went through preschool that at one point we were paying $1,600 a month for, for combination of both kids to go to Punanaleo Preschool. Uh, and today they go to Navajo Kalaniopu, which is a public charter-based school. Early childhood education, universal preschool is something that I strongly support at the federal level and at the state level. And I believe that we need to implement it across the state. I believe we need to have universal preschool and we need to have uh, preschool throughout the entire state of Hawaii, not just in the um, uh, most highly populated communities, but also in those hard to staff, hard to reach rural communities that you talked about. The new school facilities authority is one mechanism that mm -hmm. can do that with the Department of Education. 
Um, the legislature just created the SFA and, and appropriated $200 million to that. Um, I'm not a big fan of building more shiny schools. I think maybe there's a, a one or two schools we might need to meet based on population that have increased dramatically. But I would like those monies and those funds to be used to do um, uh, what is also in that bill, which is to build more pre-K and to have more pre-K classroom spaces across the state. So providing early childhood education, providing opportunities um, for kids to start school uh, much earlier. You know, we've been doing it under the Office of Early Learning. Uh, right. and there's, you know, several dozen um, uh, pilot projects and, and pre-K schools across the state, but it's nowhere nearly enough. Uh, you know, we know that um, kids who start uh, their educational journey at an earlier age are, are much more productive citizens. They're much more contributing citizens. And there's a huge return on investment for that if we can put in the necessary dollars to do that. And so that's, that's so true. Yeah. And that, let's turn to the second issue that Commit to Keiki has prioritized, which is mental health needs for families and young children. Um, all again, um, you know, we all went through COVID. Yep. It had huge mental health um, stresses that that caused. You know, 300,000 people or more have contracted it. I have one in my household right now. So, you know, we all do now, right? Yep. And then 1,500 people died of the virus. Um, and it's impacted businesses, schools, preschools, childcare centers. Our poll that we did that I just mentioned earlier, it actually had an overwhelming number of respondents. 82.5% said it's important for our next governor to prioritize programs that address mental health needs for families and young children. Personally, I was surprised it was that high, mm. uh, but it just shows that this has become a priority for everybody. So uh, under your administration as governor, how do you intend to increase mental health supports for our youngest Keiki and their families? You know, it has to start in a home. It has to start with the Ohana. You know, many of, of uh, uh, um, our, our children are being born into broken homes and, and having that supportive um, and early preventative and early intervention programs are absolutely critical for our families, many of which are living paycheck to paycheck. Um, they're struggling with alcohol. They're struggling with drugs. They don't get the type of health care that is needed. Our, our children are not getting the type of health care that they're needed. So I think it, it, it starts in the family. It starts at home. And, uh, you know, government has an obligation to, to provide those services and working together with nonprofits and allocating the funding to do that. There's a, there is uh, federal funding that we can leverage to do that, but prevention, intervention should, should always be, um, you know, something that we, we should, as a state, um, you know, start as early as possible. But I we have to coordinate it, coordinate it with public resources, working in partnerships, public-private partnerships, we can have a very comprehensive early childhood, um, whether it's mental health or, or behavioral health or development um, system in the country. And I really believe that we can do that. I think we can too. Um, I appreciate that. Just one more question, Congressman Kehele, and then um, I'll turn it over uh, to our audience to ask some more questions. We have a lot of people who are experts in early care and learning um, and early prevention and intervention, as you mentioned it. So the final one really has to do with family violence. And more than 85% of those we polled felt that the next governor should prioritize family violence prevention and intervention programs. So given what you know, uh, as you're learning, as you're going across the state on issues in family violence, such as child abuse, neglect, intimate partner violence, yeah. how will your administration increase access to family support programs? Knowing that there's only so much government can do, but there are things that government can support. So love to hear your thoughts on, on what we do in this area. You know, I, I, I always believe that um, our values uh, need to be reflected in our policies. And if in Hawaii, we value our keiki, as much as we value our kupuna, then we have an obligation to ensure that our policies and our resources and our funding reflect that. Um, and I really feel, and I'm sure most people would feel the same way, and I'm sure everyone on this is uh, Zoom feels the same way, that our children are the future generation and they are and, and must always be put first, right? We have an obligation to them and that means sacrificing today for their futures, um, whether it's uh, creating opportunities for children, early childhood investment, 
um, and creating that strong parental involvement and creating strong families. Um, you know, the science is clear that if we invest in our families, if we invest in those resources, if we leverage as much federal funding um, that we can get from the federal government to address these things, then, then we can really make a difference in the lives of, of our children and the lives of, of their families. Uh, I mean, no child should, should live in a home uh, where, they're, where they're in fear or where they're hungry. Um, but the reality is that that happens each and every day here in Hawaii. Yeah, and so yeah. it's a lack of resources. Uh, it's, it's a, um, a workforce that is burnt out, that needs more support, that means needs more help. Um, and it's, it's working together with different mm -hmm. types of programs that, that can address, you know, these, these types of issues. Um, yeah. and our, and our most at, at risk children are the ones that, uh, um, are the most vulnerable. So I, I just believe that we need to re return to our core values. Those values need to be reflected in our policies. And we need to have a solid early childhood policy that protects all children across the state. I agree. Uh, we're compiling a questions from our audience that um, Carrie will be leading you through in a minute. And so I'd encourage the audience to um, be ready to ask questions, put them in the chat. Um, yeah. While they're doing that, let me just ask you another question about your priorities. You mentioned our values. Um, and I recall a quote from a young Senator, Joe Biden, who said, don't tell me what he's he quoted as saying, don't tell me what your values are. Show me your budget and I'll tell you what your values are. I see you're smiling. So you've heard that quote before. Yeah. <laughs> so how are you going to prioritize in your budget those values of putting our church to Congress? Then? You know, it, it had well. Your budget needs to be reflected in your values, but uh, you also have to have the um, wherewithal and the understanding that it also requires 76 legislators on the fourth, third and second floors to also yeah. have and aspire to those same values. So I believe the people that uh, the governor um, uh, appoints to serve in critical mm. uh, state department positions, critical boards and commissions and the ability for the governor to work with and empower the lieutenant governor mm -hmm. and his or her team um, has to be a partnership. We have to be able to work together and to work together with the legislature is going to be important as well. I served in the state Senate for four years. I was a Ways and Means Committee for four years under both Senator Dela Cruz and Senator Takuda. And so I feel like I have a, a pretty good, solid understanding of the state budget. Um, but you know, I mean, it's it, it always depends on our economy, what type of workforce we have, how we diversify that economy uh, and 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 how those funding priorities are reflected in our values at the end of the legislative session. You know, I hope to be as uh, to be sworn in as governor on the first Monday of December, and I'm going to have about 45 days to to build a cabinet yep. to, uh, to create a budget to submit that budget to the legislature of which I'm sure some of it will be carryover from the EG administration. And so there's going to be a lot of stuff to do in a very, very short period of time. And I'm going to depend on um, individuals and organizations and community leaders like all of you on this call um, to be able to, to prioritize key funding um, lines and key funding programs that, that this state needs to do to continue the work that you guys are doing. Well, I appreciate that. And I, I love hearing um, your desire to rely on the lieutenant governor as well. And uh, just my own personal opinion, we've got a strong set of lieutenant gubernatorial candidates this time Absolutely. around, which is really great. Absolutely. Yeah, great to see. So, and, and I can't wait to to work together with that, uh, uh, that individual and yep. align our values and priorities to empower. That's what leadership is, right? You, yeah. you empower the people that you're with you elevate them to do the best that they can. You inspire them each and every day. Uh, and and I'm, I'm excited. You know, I, I can't wait. Well, I can see that. I can feel that in you. Um, the last thing I'll share until we turn it over to Carrie is that, you know, you know this from your time governing um, in your many different levels of service to the community. But, you know, a governor might have time to do two or three big things. Um, and then they get slammed with a bunch of unexpected things that they have to address, like Governor Ige was COVID, right? And Red Hill and you know, all things that you've been pined on. So it's it's going to be important to our group that somehow through all of being pushed and pulled uh, that 
your values of strong uh, opportunities for young children will, will remain uppermost despite being pulled and pushed in lots of different directions. So we appreciate hearing from you. You know, Terry, if, if given the opportunity to serve as governor of Hawaii, I'm going to have 1,462 days and 35,088 hours to lead this state. How do you use that limited allocation of time, yeah. of energy, exactly what you're talking about for the greater good of the people of Hawaii? And so, again, it goes back to what I said in the beginning. It's a kako thing. It's yeah, got to be gotta all be. of us working together, not in a vacuum, to be able to move this state forward. And so... Well, as we as we develop a kako with you right now, I'm going to turn it over to Carrie, who will lead us through some Q and A. You mentioned um, in our pre conversation, Congressman, that you wanted to listen as much as you wanted to share. Absolutely. So maybe this is an opportunity to do that. Okay. Thank you so much. Over to you, Carrie. I want to take notes. And <laughs> go for Great. it. Thank you, Terry. Um, and Kai, we do hope that you will continue to keep Keiki Bertha five um, as top priorities. They're little, but they're mighty. Yep. Um, they often get lost um, in the shuffle. So we appreciate you um, reiterating that that's a, how important that is to keep them front and center. Um, so if I can please ask Heidi, could you please bring us back to gallery? And if I can please ask the steering committee members to come on screen, we can get going with our questions. Um, the first question is coming um, through, and for those in the audience, there's a couple of ways that you can submit questions. There's a Q&A function on your Zoom um, that you can click in your bottom panel, and you can submit your question that way, and you can also put it into chat, and I'll be monitoring both. Um, so the first question comes from Amelia um, Kaiwich Kaniholani, and she asks, what about funding and supports to increase infant and toddler group day care centers? that support children with developmental disabilities? I would absolutely support that. Um, love, love uh, definitely think that that's something that is absolutely important to do. I would see if we can, you know, leverage any type of federal funds. You know, we, uh, th right now, there's $15 billion in the Child Care and Development Block Grant. And there's $24 billion in the Child Care Stabilization Grant. These are federal programs. These are federal uh, competitive grants that we need to be applying for. And I would want to see if there's any uh, types of funds we can do to do that. You know, part of uh, the, the Child Care and Development Block Grant is to utilize those funds, um, uh, not just for essential workers, but also possibly for discretionary funding by state agencies to fund child care and development type centers uh, through that fund. And these funds need to be liquidated and utilized by September 20th of 2024, I believe. And so there's, there's still opportunity for us to apply for them, to obligate them by the end of next year or by September, the, the fiscal year of 2023. So that would be in September 30th. Um, and that's something I would want to look at doing. Great. Thank you. Um, steering committee members. So Kai, you're blessed here to have folks from early childhood mental health, um, from family violence prevention and intervention programs, as well as child care and early learning. Um, who are experts. And so um, hopefully the steering committee members have some key questions that they would like to ask you. Sure. Hello. Um, I, I was wondering, Carrie, I know I said I, I believe in it and I have to um, go pick up a kid at uh, Summer Fun and Summer Fun don't play. Two o'clock means two o'clock. So, hello, <laughs> <laughs> Kai. Nice to meet you. Oh, oh, right on. Uh, uh, and you know, um, born and raised, I've been a social worker for a while now, born and raised out on, on the west side of Oahu. And I was raised by a cultural advocate who said years ago that when we exploit land, it's going to be very hard. For every house we build and job we get, it makes it harder for our, our, our keiki to afford it in the future. Um, and when, when I think about mental health and, and I think about family violence, yeah. I think, how do how does a leader such as yourself, and I, I think you would have the pull, right? Um, um, how do we understand that, that violence in a home in Puna or a violence in a home in Waianae um, does not happen in a vacuum, right? And that it affects everybody in the state in the long term. We see the increase in gun violence. Everybody go, how did that happen? I think you can track them. You can trace them. You can find out when, 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 we, be, when, when we began to normalize, turn away from, not my problem. And then all of a sudden, it's a crisis. Mm -hmm. And so I wonder, as if, if you were next governor, how do we have the investment banker in Kahala understand that that violence in the home in Makaha will someday affect you. 
how do we how do we lead that charge well you know the areas you just named are some of our most marginalized areas they're the ones that um, often are under resourced understaffed off the radar you know i grew up down in milolii down in south kona you know where where i saw it with my own eyes mm-hmm. you know i remember being at luau's uh when i was a kid and 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 watching my uncle beat up and and uh and and pound out his wife right at there at the luau right and uh, as, as kids that's something that's seared in my memory mm-hmm. even just sitting right now here at 48 years of age uh this is unacceptable it absolutely is unacceptable and it happens in our most challenged communities it's often our native hawaiian communities uh and and i think having that's even more reason why having a leader that has those types of experiences and uh and 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 um can bring those life experiences to the office of the governor i think is going to be really really important and and really and really critical so that those that aren't usually uh ma'a to that or can't understand that um are given a chance to to understand it through individuals like yourself and through myself so we can better better address it in our communities um with resources and with funding um and with support mahalo brother thank you mahalo thank you kanoi thank you kai um we have a question in chat from rosemary um kalaikini and she asks uh, Families are the first and most critical teachers of young children. What are your views on family child interaction programs and how you support culture-based family child interaction learning programs for Ohana caregivers and their kiki? You know, I, I always like the idea of science-based um but also very culturally appropriate, culturally relevant. You know, we ch- those as a family to raise our daughters um in the kumu honua mauli ola family construct which is part of the navahi and the punana leo um uh i guess family wellness and family upbringing and so that's something that i really believe uh is a a a place based culturally based model um that that we should replicate throughout the state um you know the family in ohana is a center for absolutely everything and uh and, and having strong parental involvement uh create strong families um and and like like we just talked about previously it's our most marginalized communities often that that are the are the are the communities that are hurting the most and so um having programs that can do that i think uh, uh and giving more opportunities um to do that would be really important i mean i wish we had you know the punana leo or punana leo type similar programs across the state for every you know a punana leo you can start at 9 months old and so it's 9 months to 5 to 3 years and then 3 years to 5 years for the actual punana leo preschool i think we should have that all over the state i think it should be free i think we should give every child the opportunity and every family the opportunity to do that one of the things a punana leo does is it pulls in the the parents to be a part of their their children's learning um the uh the value based uh, ohana value based um uh, foundational concepts of those programs um start to embed themselves into the family and the families grow together and so i think that's something that i would like to see as governor replicated across the state and we can do it through our universal pre-k programs we can do it uh through these um new funding mechanisms at the legislature uh just provided um to create more pre-k classrooms across the state and have ones that are more culturally based um but also merging science and what we know is is critically important in the early development of our of our kiki great thank you um and with those new facilities it's really focused on 3 and 4 year olds and so i appreciate you bringing up the importance of care and early learning for infants and toddlers as well from birth to age 5 so thank you for that Um Kai Lani you had a follow up question? Hi Aloha Kai Congressman Kai. Hey, hello. Aloha. Aloha. <laughs> um yeah I I just wanted to kind of follow up on that and I, I think you kind of answered it towards the end of your last response. Um but I I wanted to get a little bit more into detail because we do for early childhood care and learning and uh we we do have that mixed delivery system here in Hawaii which is unique 
um, to be inclusive of that language pathway that you, you're referring to with the Hawaiian language medium education. Um, and, and one of the things that, um, you know, I want to be really, I'm trying to be really aware of, and even with the, the recent attempts at federal policy that we saw almost move through, um, is what kind of protections we can put into legislation to make sure that things um, like the you know Hawaiian medium pathway that has had a tremendous amount of growth and success um, is protected as legislation comes out. And I think you know there there may be some other areas that um, that would be relevant as well beyond the Hawaiian medium language Hawaiian language medium pathway. But I just wanted to see if you had any ideas for for how we could kind of ensure those protections when we're talking about new legislation for things like a say it is universal pre-k um just wanted to see what your thoughts are on that yeah you know as when i was serving as vice chair of education under um senator kidani you know th th this definitely came up quite a bit and protecting uh what we currently have in terms of uh hawaiian medium education with with a broader universal statewide pre-k program um, because as you all know, um, you know, it's not free to go to Punaleo and, uh, the costs went up, you know, we were in Punaleo for over five years and, uh, we we're fortunate that we could send our kids, uh, to school, but many other Hawaiian families were not able to. Um, and so we're, I mean, working together with all of you, uh, I think is critical as governor and, uh, you know, the governor has the first opportunity to introduce the governor's package of uh, new policy and new types of legislation that are required um, in the upcoming legislative session and the subsequent ones. Um, but I would totally seek out the opportunity to um, help craft that legislation or work together with community leaders and early childhood education leaders like, like all of you and yourself um, to ensure that the, there's that type of education, Hawaiian medium education is, is protected, especially in the early childhood education years. You know, our, our kids uh, grew up and uh, for their age six and eight, now they speak Olalo Hawaii, you know, and are, and are bilingual. And we, we can see uh, how much uh, stronger they are in the classroom uh, when, when they're um, bilingual and they go between Hawaiian and English, uh, depending on where they are. And so, you know, we are we're sold on, on, on that concept. And, and, uh, and, and we think it's also happening at other schools, primarily in our private schools that, that are introducing second languages, third languages at an earlier uh, age in their life. Mahalo. Mahalo. Thank you, Joanne. Joanne, I'm sorry, I think you're on mute. I was saying hi, Congressman. Um, I'm Joanne uh, Farnsworth, and we haven't met. Um, but I am currently very involved with the Association for Infant Mental Health here and other maternal and child health initiatives in the state. But for 25 years, I provided um, services to our youngest children and families on the Big Island. So I ran early childhood programs over on the west side, Hawaii, you know, Kona side, yeah. and struggled, you know, my question really has to do with how do we really encourage, and I don't know if subsidies, I mean, one of the, one of the questions that I really have to you is how do, you know, do you think that there is any value or possibility of subsidizing services in these hard to reach communities? You know, so when the state will put out an RFP, it's the same same for everybody, whether you're providing services, you know, in Kau, you know, or whether you're providing services in Waianae or anywhere. And so we know that those there's real differentials in those communities and i'm um, how do you what are your ideas for how we really get services to the families with the youngest children who are in these pockets of very difficult to reach places well you know you bring up a great point you know the department of education uh has 
and it is, in a, is doing it through differential pay for uh, hard to reach areas. You're either subsidizing it or incentivizing it, right? There's, there's really no way. Um, uh, those are the two primary methods uh, to do it. And so through differential pay, you know, we are staffing hard to reach um, or hard to serve communities in the Department of Education. And that would ultimately be um, another model that, that you would have to u- utilize. You know, I, I also think that government can't do everything. And not, there are nonprofits that focus and specialize on this that can do that. And so having a deeper partnership with um, our, our public resources, working in partnership with the private sector, um, with nonprofits, I think are really, really important um, to provide those services. You know, there's a lot of community organizations foundations, nonprofits, working with schools, working with employers um, that can ensure that every child uh, and young child, whether has access to early prevention, early intervention programs, um, high quality preschool, um, you know, that, that, that's just something, again, it goes back to our values. It goes back to our policy and how that policy is reflected in our budget. At the end of the day, it's how we're going to pay for it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Joanne. And I liked your question about an idea about subsidizing the workforce. <laughs> it's an important one. Thank you. Um, Alice, you, oh, go ahead. No, I just, I mean, I just keep coming back to, and, and, and we talked about it earlier. We leave millions of dollars on the table from the federal government that we are not applying for, we're not competing for. You said 42nd state in the nation. That is absolutely unacceptable. My administration, your administration, would make the the sourcing of federal funds our number one priority. We shouldn't be leaving any federal funding uh, out there. And and I've heard it time and time again, whether it's trying to solve wastewater issues or other types of uh, problems in this state, I constantly hear it from federal agencies. The state of Hawaii doesn't apply. You know, my staff has a meeting once a quarter with the office of the governor, and usually they're listening and there's not much interaction there. That needs to change. Uh, Our congressional delegation has to work tightly with the office of the governor, with nonprofits uh, that know where the demonstrated community need need is so we can source um, the federal funds that are available to help this state. Um, and again, whether it's co- child care stabilization grants, development block grants, there's money out there, but we need to apply for them. So we need to change how the office of the governor is currently doing that. And um, I would have a, a small, like little tiger team in the office of the governor whose sole purpose in life is federal funding and federal grant writing um, and working together with, with um, you know, different community leaders in different sectors of our our state and economy and community um, to go after those federal types of funds. Great. Can I just jump in because I was an and, because, you know, often we, and often we do not use the federal funds that we do have, you know, because of backups and jam ups in departments to get contracts out because they're short of staff and many other issues. So, you know, the, the, my belief honestly is that it's not always a lack of money that keeps, you know, things from getting to people who need it, you know, but there's other, there's other road jams. Um, and I, I think that the idea of really working with, closely with the folks, you know, who provide the services, who really truly know what those road jams are, is yep. is going to be uh, really important in moving moving this forward. So thank I couldn't, you. Couldn't uh, agree more. You know, the office of the governor needs to be restructured. Yeah. You know, and, and maybe it's my twenty two years in the military, but I look at organizational efficiencies, lines of authority, um, making making the office of the governor more accountable, more transparent, more efficient. Um, more open, you know, having someone in the cabinet uh, or, or having a, um, a task force created to address these issues would be something that I would want to do from, from, from day one. You know, whether it's leveraging a billion dollars in the Head Start program for ARP or um, leveraging $150 million through the um, Maternal, Infant, and Early Childhood Home Visiting Program. 
Uh, you know, we talked, or, or Kanoi brought the question up earlier about violence in the home. Well, there's $150 million there that can go towards preventing child abuse, neglect, um, not just supporting uh, maternal and child health. Um, that funding is appropriate to states, to tribal entities, um, which, which means we can use it for Native Hawaiian programs, home visiting programs. Uh, you know, so there, there's a lot of things we can do out there. And, um, and, and they need to be prioritized. You know, whoever's the next governor, whether it's myself or any of the other candidates running, there's a lot of work ahead. And, and I'm, I'm willing and, and ready to, to dedicate, you know, a lot of my time and effort to do that. I need my wife and my kids by my side. Being 5,000 miles away in Washington, D.C. is very, very difficult for our young family right now. And so, um, you know, I need them close to me. And, 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 and it's going to take a lot of hard work to, uh, to get this state moving again. But there is a historic level of funding that is available to us from multiple funding streams. Um, but it's going to take a coordinated effort to do that. And I couldn't agree more. You know, all of you in the field, all of you that are boots on the ground, down in the weeds, you know how to make things happen. You know where the investments um, uh, you know, need to be put and, and how we can address these issues. And sometimes government just has to get out of the way. And, and get the money to where it's needed as quick as possible. And, and, um, and let's all work together to, to, to solve these issues that, that we have. And so that, that's something as, as governor, you're going to require a hands-on governor and, and one that doesn't micromanage. I try not to micromanage. If there's anything growing up as a, as a military officer, you know, I've, I've, I've been under great leaders. I've been under not so great leaders. And so I've, I've tried to take the best out of, the leadership I've experienced um, and, and will apply those uh, in, in the office of the governor. Great, thank you. And you talked about um, restructuring the governor's office. Alice had a question um, that she wanted to ask you specifically about that. Alice? Oh yeah, um, ironically, uh, Kai, you pretty much just talked about it, but um, if I could ask a different question, Carrie, perhaps, sure. um, yeah. So I'm curious about um, the level of investment that it's gonna take to accomplish some of these priorities, particularly um, the universal pre-K or, or something like that. Um, it's, you know, even after all of the federal funding is, is tapped into, um, you know, how would you go about um, securing additional state funds for particularly that priority? Great question. Um, you know, it, again, it comes down to priorities, comes down to values. If this is something that we need to do as a state, if we feel that investing in our Keiki um, beyond K through 12, uh, in preschool, in early childhood, before preschool, if this is something that we feel is a policy priority for the state, then it's going to take a governor to lead on it. It's going to take a governor to convince 76 other, other legislators to do it. And it's going to require tough choices and tough decisions to be made by the office of the governor and by the legislature working together with the community. Um, you know, we already allocate over $2 billion to the Department of Education. And, and we, got a, we got a lot of work to do in the Department of Education right now. Um, so how are you going to address all of that and then stand up this statewide, you know, every child has the opportunity to go to preschool for free or for a subsidized uh, cost, um, uh, it's, it's going to be a massive undertaking. Um, if you don't diversify the economy, if you don't bring in more revenue, then you have to raise taxes. And what types of taxes do you want to raise? Well, we could tax real estate investment trusts. Uh, we could create different tax brackets, uh, of course, working together with the counties that have the authority over property taxes. Um, you know, that is something that we could look at. Right now, we're spending um, a lot of money on the rail project uh, through GE taxes and through transit and accommodation taxes. Uh, these major capital projects uh, for the state is, is, is a um, major issue for this state because it's taking away critical funds that we should be using and could be using for other priorities. Um, of course, working together with the lieutenant governor's office, office is going to be important. Um, but uh, these are the choices that are going to have to be made, and there's no 
there's no silver bullet on how to fix them, but it's going to take resources. It's going to take leveraging federal funds to do it. And ultimately it's going to be an investment by the state to do that. And uh, you know, these are, we're going to have to work together to do it. And I don't have a, um, a simple answer for you, except that, you know, it's, it's X's and O's, right? It's, do we have the money to do it or don't we, how do we create the money and how do we make government more efficient so that we have more money to do it? Thank you. Thank you. And I, I think what was compelling in the polling results is we did poll in the second go around. Um, we, we posed the question, if it were to cost a billion dollars, would you support the governor prioritizing and would you be willing to help pay for it? And 62% said yes. Okay. We then asked the next question. We said, what if it, what if it costs two billion? So we just wanted to see the differential. I mean, that's, that isn't the proposed cost. But we wanted to see if we went higher, what would voters say? And we were so shocked that 68% said yes. Um, so the nice thing is we know that the voters um, are with us um, and with the next governor in prioritizing our youngest um, and getting those programs and services um, to, um, to them. Um, Stephen Morse asked a question. He said, what would you do as governor to make housing affordable for our children and families? That's a long answer. Um, uh, because it is a multi-pronged problem here in this state. And, uh, you know, um, I'm sure you guys, well, maybe some of you, you remember The Price of Paradise? Remember those books? Those, Yeah, yeah, Terry, you remember. It's the Price of Paradise, right? There are two volumes, and uh, they were written by um, in the early 1990s. You can open up The Price of Paradise in the first volume, and I just read it the other day again. And it's talking about affordable housing. And it's the same issues we have then. And what they were talking about that back then was that single family homes were at like $350,000 and condos were at like $90,000 and it was skyrocketing housing prices. And look at where housing is now today. Uh, what didn't exist back then was short-term vacation rentals, um, was, was uh, these economic models that over the last decade or maybe even two decades went unaddressed and caused the, co the, the price of housing to skyrocket. Um, you know, whether it's creating property tax rates with the counties because they have that power to disincentivize short-term vacation rentals um, by creating a property um, class for non-occupied um, homes is one thing. Uh, maybe creating a vacancy tax for homes that are vacant. There are currently 70,000 homes vacant on the island of Oahu. There's hundreds of homes vacant in the Department of Hawaiian Homelands. Uh, that needs to be addressed. Um, making planning and permitting and, and the supply chain uh, issues that, that are um, those that provide the building materials to build our homes is also something that needs to be addressed. Um, you know, I'm someone who has taken a, a clear position in this race that I am totally uh, against uh, building uh, potentially a $500 million new public works project by building a stadium in the Halava parcel. I think if you are serious about affordable housing, then let's build housing. Let's not build another stadium. We can't even finish rail yet. And we're going to go try and build a new stadium. Um, I want to build 10,000 workforce homes in the 98 acre parcel where Aloha Stadium is. I want to redevelop the stadium to Waikiki along the rail line, live, work, play, vertical, dense, use every state county parcel. We should be buying property back. We should be working together with KS to develop um, a, a, a live, work, play model where you don't even need a car. You live in, in that corridor and you work there uh, and you can enjoy raising your family there. Um, I still want a stadium as a University of Hawaii, you know, Rainbow Warrior volleyball player. But uh, I really believe that stadium should be built either um, priority one out in Kapolei um, or on the lower campus. It just depends on the size of the stadium. You can't build a 40,000 uh, seat stadium uh, on, on the practice fields. It, it would have to be built out in Kapolei, which I think is also a reason why we need to connect University of Hawaii Manoa on the rail line to UH West Oahu. Um, our military exacerbates the cost of housing on the island of Oahu because we have 14,000 active duty service members that live off base, that live off in our military or in our normal, in our residential housing communities. So working together with our military leaders, and I just put an amendment in the National Defense Authorization Act um, that would look at 
military housing and ensuring that active duty service members live on base to the max extent possible uh, would be something that I think um, would help fix our housing uh, issues here. DHHL is another one. Um, if we can address DHHL, we can get Native Hawaiians into homes and, and out of the rental market. And ultimately, at the end of the day, um, if you want to um, uh, reduce the cost of housing, then government has to put in, like we do for DHHL, the infrastructure, the roads, the, the, the electrical, um, the, the wastewater infrastructure into these developments. Uh, but we're always fighting. Right. We're, we're fighting for ag land. We're fighting for um, places to develop lands that we need to keep into conservation. Uh, and so it's a it's a challenge here. Um, and our land use laws make it a challenge. Um, and so it's it's a it's it's a multi pronged approach to address the affordable housing or to address housing in this in this state, especially on the island of Oahu. And, um, you know, those those are some quick thoughts that I have on, on, on how to do that. It's, it's going to take the county um, and, and the office of the governor um, to be able to do that. And, and are there any uh, executive emergency actions that the governor can do in terms of zoning, planning, permitting, to get projects up and running as quick as possible without compromising um, uh, you know, our uh, important agricultural lands or our, our, our conservation lands or um, you know, the lands that were never designated through general plans for, for housing. We only have so much land, right? We're, we're an island. We're, we have a, a center of an island that is mountainous. We can't build there. Uh, and so there's only so many places that we can continue to develop. But again, you know, building a, a, a stadium on the Halava parcel is something that I, I think is a, is a horrible idea. And uh, if you're really serious about housing, let's build housing. Well, and then looking at those wraparound support services that can be com combined with affordable housing so that, like you said, people work and play and get services yep. and childcare where they live. Yep. Um, so thank you. It's two o'clock and I just want to be very mindful of everybody's time. Um, Aaron, I know that went so fast. Aaron does have so a fast. final question. Um, if Kai, do you have a couple more minutes to answer Aaron's yeah. question? And we'll yeah, go for it. No, no problem. Thank you, hey, Aaron. Mahalo, Nui. Um, aloha, um, I'm Aaron. I am from the Association for Infant Mental Health in Hawaii. And so um, thank you so much for your time and for sharing um, your, your thoughts and whatnot all on, on the future. Um, the question I have is that infant and early childhood mental health, it really does span the spectrum of the prenatal to five field. And so there are lots of different providers who are involved in supporting um, the early childhood arena. Um, what would you put in place? I know we talked a lot about leveraging funding. What specifically would you want to put in place to ensure that mental health awareness, education, consultation would be available to families and or providers, um, especially in these early years? I mean, we could expand. I mean, along the lines of universal pre-K, right? We could have universal prenatal care. We can have uh, programs that educate um, um, and provide opportunities for young families, for mothers um, uh, to be able to get nutrition education, alcohol, drug cessation um, uh, education, any types of additional health care screening programs, um, um, uh, substance abuse prevention. Um, I mean, I think these are programs that, that I think we could we can also uh, implement and work on as well. Um, and, and I mean, to be honest, I'm not the expert in the uh, in the field. And so if you have suggestions, I would love to hear them um, in a follow on conversation um, on, on how we can better uh, address these types of programs, how we can create effective intervention programs, um, you know, working together with uh, the public and the private sector. Thank you, Kai. Terry, back to you. Great, thank you. Congressman Kaheli, we just really appreciate you taking the time to be in this conversation with us. As you just said in your last answer, you know, you're know you not the expert, but a lot of these people are. So please reach out to them if you um, are, are curious to know how to turn these ideas into action. We just um, wanted to share with everyone who is on this conversation today, if you like what you heard and you wanna learn more about Kai Kaheli's campaign, 
please go to www.kaikaheli.com. And also a quick reminder, we're going to be holding our next talk story a day after tomorrow, Thursday, July 7th, with candidate Heidi Tsuneyoshi from 1 to 2 p.m. So we hope you'll all have the opportunity to join us there. And then finally, just on behalf of all of us who would commit to Keiki, thank you for joining us. And for more information and to stay update, uh, up to date on Commit to Keiki happenings, please follow us on Facebook or Instagram, Twitter, and please uh, frequently visit our website, committokeiki.org. Mahalo, and especially to you, uh, Kai Kahele, mahalo to you. Have a great day, everyone. Aloha. Aloha. Mahalo. Ahui ho. Ahui ho.